Hello and welcome to Film de Siècle, the film and media channel focused on all things 90s and 2000s. This week, Seb and Ollie will be discussing... The A-Team! Hello and welcome back to Film de Siècle, the film and media discussion channel where we talk about all things 1990s to 2000s. And today we've got something that feels like it belongs in neither, really. Uh, it's a movie made at the very end of our time period in 2010, but was based on a TV series from the 1980s. So this is quite an interesting thing for us to look at. It's the A-Team movie with yeah, Liam yeah. Neeson. Yeah, th- this is uh, interesting. I only saw it that once with you, and I remember very little about it, to did be honest. Did we see it in the cinema, or did we see it on DVD? I can't remember. No, I, I got the Blu-ray years ago, and um, we just watched it at home. Yeah, because I went to see this with a couple of relatives who were visiting from Spain, of all places, and... Uh, yeah, it was a real fun time. I enjoyed it. Uh, it was a, it was probably the best version of what it could have been because, to my mind, I can't think of a better live action adaptation of the A Team TV show. I can't remember whether or not I'd agree with that. Well, having watched a bunch of episodes on UK TV Gold, partially out of boredom in the past, I feel like it perfectly encapsulates what the show is all about, if that makes sense. And it perfectly encapsulates the characters with complete recasts, which is one hell of a thing to achieve. Well, I remember the show being, like, sincere fluff, like a live-action Saturday morning cartoon, that kind of thing. That's a brilliant way to describe it, because it's the most harmless form of violence, in a way, because there's loads of explosions, there's loads of high-octane action and chases and fights, but nobody really gets hurt in the end of it. No, nobody dies. <laughs> and that's what I love about it. It's so endearing and sweet, and it sort of carries over that um, <laughs> feeling of just cheesiness and ridiculousness and just fun for the sake of fun. All right, you've got me enthused now. Let's... Uh... <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Uh, I wish I had more to say about my memories of it. I remember that one bit where the guy, well, with the helicopter, and the guy yeah. falls. Murdoch. Yeah. And the guy gets caught in the helicopter. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I like how this has an origin story for Mr. T. Well, not Mr. T. That's the actor. Uh, B.A. Baracus's Fear of Flying. Yeah, yeah. The funny thing is, this is a character, more than any other, that probably gets associated with our actor to the point where people can't differentiate between Mr. T and B.A. Baracus, the character he plays on the A-Team. Yeah. Yet Rampage Jackson does a brilliant job of playing the character despite this. Well, Mr. T has that effect on all his characters. No one says Clubber Lang. No. No, no, no one, one calls him says Clubber Lang. Lang. They just call him Mr. T from Rocky Free, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's a bit like the old Ehrenreich effect it's one of those where you couldn't imagine anyone else playing the original role but when someone else does come along and play the role a lot of people agree yeah they did a good job come to think of it Yeah. Uh, it took quite, quite a bit to get this project off the ground because I think it went through several rewrites and production hell before we finally got the A-Team movie that we saw who else was in this let me think uh, we've got Lee, oh Lee. Yeah, Liam Neeson, of course. Rampage Jackson, as I've said. Uh, Jessica Biel, funnily enough. Oh. If you can Jessica Biel leave it. Yeah, yeah. It was produced by Stephen J. Canal, who produced the TV show. So there's some continuity there. Yeah. Uh, the screenplay was written by a few people who I think worked on the TV show. And it also had Bradley Cooper, who hasn't been in that much lately. Was he in a few... Um, uh, Quentin Tarantino movies, I feel like. I don't know, I haven't really been following his career, to be honest. No, although I'd say that the four main characters were passed pretty well, actually. And I remember a lot of things working for me at the time, like the change of location for the origin story being Iraq instead of Vietnam made sense, since it's set in the present day. You could sort of view it as both a soft reboot and an origin story. And I like that it works as both. Yeah, yeah. Because not many things can achieve that, really. It's a difficult balance to strike. And I think they struck it pretty well, actually. Yeah. 
It also had an application on the iPhone, which a lot of the movies we reviewed didn't. I don't know what that would consist of, but it had one. I cool. wonder. We, we should actually play some of these old games, like the A Team app or the Babe 2 video game, which, of course, everybody was crying out for. Yeah, yeah. Six <laughs> years after the movie's release. Having said that, that's one of our most successful videos. It is. It is that we didn't promote. Okay, so shall we go ahead and watch the 2010 18 movie? All right, yes, let's. I ain't getting no screening. Oh, wait, we are. Okay, yeah. see you there. And we're back. We've watched the 18 movie. So, Ollie, did you like the 18 movie? I did on the whole, yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a fun time. I do have to note there was a kind of. I kind of felt like the tone was fighting itself in places. I know what you mean. It was made in the era of Nolan and where action films all had to be gritty and serious. And I feel like they yeah. sort of had to lean into that aesthetic just to get it made. Yeah. And convince people that it wasn't a horrible idea. That aesthetic says gritty reboot, whereas the tank flying scene in particular says classic A-team. And I just wish they'd went whole hog with the classic A-team stuff. Me too, because it was the only opportunity they were ever realistically going to get to make a live-action A-Team movie. It's not a big enough or a beloved enough franchise to really get a second shot at this, so they really should have gone in all in on that. But I do like that it was basically in plot and in deed and in spirit a two-hour episode of the A-Team show. Yeah, yeah. It could be a pilot. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to look at it. Like, I don't know, actually... If I were saying to somebody, you really need to watch the A-Team show from the 1980s, for whatever reason, I'd say start with the movie, then watch the show, because this serves as a really good origin story, despite the fact that they've uh, readapted it to a modern-day setting. Some might consider it a soft reboot, but really yeah. that's all it is soft, because there's none of this other than the whole Vietnam or Iraq thing really contradicts the show. Yeah, that's true. And... um I do like how true to the spirit of the silliness of it they are. Because uh, Murdoch is using gunpowder to cook steaks. Because let's face it, explosions cause no long-lasting damage in this universe. No, not in the A-Team, they don't. Like... No, they don't hurt. I mean, I think they were genuinely surprised when an explosion killed somebody. And even then, it didn't actually kill them because he faked yeah. his own death in order to disguise himself in order to steal the plates, I guess? Because being a high-ranked military colonel apparently doesn't pay enough? I don't know. I don't, I don't understand his motivation, but that was the big twist, that the guy yeah. who um, Hannibal Smith was old friends with, who was this big army colonel, set him up in order to steal these counterfeit uh, currency plates. Yeah, to print money. Yeah, uh, yeah, the plot was a bit weird, but it's the A-Team movie. Of course the plot's going to be a bit silly. Yeah, and there's um, a few... Oh, I, I was going to get to it later, but there's the heist movie trope at the end where it turns out that everything that happened was part of the plan. Well, that's the thing about the A-Team. They put together a plan, they improvise uh, the scheme based on whatever equipment or weaponry or things lying around they have at their disposal. And then they go in and conduct the plan, and they're always successful with no collateral damage or injuries. And the plan comes together, and then Hannibal says he loves it when that happens and lights up a cigar. He's right. Well observed. That does generally happen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you've got um, Murdoch, who is called Howling Mad Murdoch, despite the fact he's not really mad. He's just a bit eccentric. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's the kind of madness where you play pranks on people. It's not the kind of madness where there's actual psychosis or, you know, anything that would be a danger to One of the um, lines I liked from him was when he was cooking the steak. He said, I got a little Bell's palsy the last time I ate that. He said, it's only partial paralysis. <laughs> yeah. That's the kind of funny dialogue they had on the show, though, and I love that they maintain that yeah. place. And they also explained B.A. Baracus' fear of flying, which didn't need to happen, but I'm not sorry it did. Yeah, I mean, it's ironic considering that his initials are literally British Airways. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that's what it stands for, but okay. I think he's just very proud of his art degree. 
<laughs> yeah, Bachelor of Arts. Uh, I don't know what he had it in. Um, he's quite good at mechanics. That would be a BSC, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, it's interesting how everyone gets their own little character arc, which I don't suppose they would have had so much in the show, because the show was almost like an action sitcom, if that makes sense. Yeah, you had to maintain the status quo, so the characters wouldn't have changed a lot. Yeah, whereas you can do that with a movie, uh, I suppose... I don't know what Hannibal Smith's character arc is. I suppose passing on the torch a bit. Um... Oh, they do that shifting diegesis trope we like as well yeah. when he's cremating Hannibal, yeah. the guy that we said should have been Glenn Shadix. Yeah, he had the spirit of Glenn about him. Yeah, that would have been a great Glenn Shadix role. Uh, now, let's not do him dirty. The guy was good. Yeah, he was good uh, in that very short role where he was a funeral director who was bored at work, put on a bit of music and put the body in the burner and then it turned out that the body... It's a very good thing he woke up when he did, wasn't it? Yeah, that and exactly very that badly. Exactly that moment. And not a moment too soon or late. Is it the type of tranquilizer that stops your heart and then revives you upon exposure of flames? I guess. That's for science. Yeah. I mean, who cares about science in an 18 movie? Big explosions happen and nobody gets hurt. Yeah. Like, nobody even twists their ankle or anything like that. <laughs> no, injury is just not a thing. Uh, didn't uh, Liam Neeson hit a guy with a car and then have him get off after? Yeah. Or did I imagine that? Uh, no, I, f- I, I seem to remember that. Uh, I also remember them ramming through that toll booth, but there was no one in that. What else? There was that bit where they explode the car and that there's no way the person inside the car would have survived. Yeah, I'm a bit mixed up on BA's whole character arc in this because I kind of think it's interesting that he gets this whole one about... Uh... Again, it's confusing because we don't know if he's renounced violence entirely or just killing people, in which case... I don't know, that's fine because it's in the spirit of the show because he does engage in acts of violence, but... Obviously, he doesn't kill anyone, which they shouldn't, unless it's an last resort anyway. So it's not very clear as to whether he's become a pacifist or whether he's just given up on killing people, which I guess is good practice if you're on the run from the law. Yeah. Yeah, that's a bit confusing. Uh, I think it's an interesting character arc, and I like that during that whole character arc, he doesn't have the mohawk, he just lets it grow out. I think that's quite funny, because... It's yeah. ironic that we've got this character doing this. And then at the end you see the Mohawk again. After he beats up the main villain. Again, yeah. he doesn't so, kill him, so it's not like anything's changed. He's not done any turn. The return of the Hawk. Yeah, that was the character arc. He decided not to have a Mohawk in the second act after having a Mohawk, and then at the end he resumes having the Mohawk. That is his character arc. He only renounced killing. Yeah. He said he can't kill. Well, he said non-violence at the time, but he was specific saying he can't kill. Yeah. I, I suppose him defending himself wouldn't count, or would it? I don't know what a non-violent vow entails, whether there are exceptions. Yeah, I mean, he doesn't really go into detail. He doesn't say, right, here's the rules, number one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't kill anybody, so don't ask. So basically, he's Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> He can't bring back the dead either. So yeah, he is the genie from Aladdin. Yeah, nor can he make people fall in love. No, he can't. Uh, apparently Face can. Uh, yeah, apparently Face can. I mean, that's something that carried on from the show where he was just very good at seducing women and that was his character. And that yeah. carries over to this. But in this, he's presented as more of a sort of a apprentice figure to Qui-Gon Jinn, as it were, being... So basically, the torch gets passed on to him at the end and he can now make plans just as well as uh, as Hannibal can. Yeah, and then at the end he's the one to say, I love it when a plan comes together, when he pulls the key out of his mouth that that woman kissed into his mouth. Like, was that set up? I I don't remember that there being any prior chemistry between them. There, There was, because there was the whole thing where Jessica Biel and them had a previous thing, and then uh, they got close, and then she didn't want to commit to like a long-term relationship, but he did. And then they talk about it a bit in Berlin, and because she's working for the army, I guess that doesn't happen, because if you're working for the army, it's not a good idea to date a fugitive. Uh, yeah, I suppose it wouldn't be, would it? No, bad practice, to be honest, Ollie. Bad practice. 
Yeah, no, but no. That's the thing. Why does he get to say that at the end? He planned for none of that. They were very surprised that they were arrested at the end. And she yeah. clearly planned that because it was Jessica Biel that had the lock pick in her mouth at that time. Well, it was a key, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, the key. She had the key in her mouth when she kissed him and passed the key into his mouth. So he had nothing to do with that plan. It was all her plan. And he took credit for it at the end. Well, he just says, I love it when a plan comes together. He doesn't specify that it has to be his plan. <laughs> That's very true. He admires <laughs> the art of a plan coming together. Yeah, he just likes when plans come together. I do as well, actually. Yeah. Then again, it's face we're talking about. He knows all about things coming together. <laughs> because he likes sex. <laughs> I see. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to dig out these questions. How well did the film achieve its goals? And what were they? Well, I think I covered that. It's like, it. half the scenes achieve... Like, it depends on what those goals were because this film doesn't really seem to be able to decide, because half the scenes that are in it are like a gritty reboot of the A-Team, <laughs> whereas the other half are just like a big-budget version of the 80s TV show. Yeah, it feels like they're having to masquerade as a gritty reboot in order to get made in the first place. Yeah, so, but that keeps it from committing to either one. Yeah, like if it was a bit brighter and more colourful... And embraced the silliness a bit more. Even in the tank flying scene, which is probably my favourite scene in the film, yeah. um, the score says we're meant to be taking this seriously. Yeah. Whereas what's happening doesn't. Yeah, it's a very big movie score. I mean, they don't really go full Nolan at any point, but they don't exactly go full wacky either. I love the classic A-Team stuff that we get, and even the gritty reboot stuff is at least watchable. I mean, you even get the original soundtrack in the bit where they break um, Murdoch out of prison. Well, no, it's not prison. It's sort of this, uh, I don't know. Mental yeah, hospital. Yeah, mental hospital, uh, where he gets everyone... To... I love how excited everyone is for the 3D movie. And I yeah. feel like that's a meta joke on the fact that 3D was becoming popular in cinemas again. Yeah. <laughs> so I kind of like the very... I don't remember if this movie was released in 3D, actually. I believe it was. It was in 2010. It would have been. Because Avatar in 2009 sort of kicked that whole thing off again, didn't it? Oh, yeah. Everything was 3D after Avatar. Because the whole thing was, yeah. it's Avatar, but in 3D. You've got to see it in 3D because it looks amazing in 3D. And it did, and people forgot every aspect of the movie a year later. Yeah, like... I mean, we should cover that, but I like. There's no cultural footprint of that film. I don't know. Unobtainium film was so successful. Unobtainium. I mean, it was the highest grossing film for like a decade, and no one remembers it. The villain was Colonel Chip Hazard, and they did dances with wolves, but with aliens. Yeah, I think that's all you really need to remember. Yeah, that's all you really need to remember. Just watch Dances with Wolves again because it's better in every way, and watch Small Soldiers, because that's a very fun movie. We'll probably revisit that when we inevitably cover Avatar. Actually, I think all three of those movies come within the same time period. Oh, yeah. I think so. We could cover all of them. Yeah, we could probably do that. I haven't Wolves. actually seen Dances with Wolves, and I've only Ooh, seen you're in for a treat. Kid. Yeah, so. you're in for a treat with that one. Yeah. Anyway, back to the 80s. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah, I kind of agree with you. Uh, but this was at the time when all big action movies had to be really serious. Uh, yeah, and apparently they, that's what they had. That, they also had that Christopher Nolan esque color grading, where everything was a bit green. Yeah, everything had like a dark, had kind of a green tint to it. And every movie for about four years was basically trying to be the Dark Knight. Like, I think he, like Skyfall, for example, where they had the main villain be a bit jokery and then yeah. get arrested on purpose. And then they did it again for Spectre, whereas at least Skyfall was a good movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, I won't even get into Spectre here. No, uh, my blood pressure wouldn't allow it. <laughs> But no, no. <laughs> no, um, because this was at the time when any movies that were fun and zany and really leaned into its source material, like, for example, the Sam Raimi Spider Man movies, especially the later ones, the Star Wars prequels, uh, even the Joel Schumacher Batman, were all being panned for being too silly and hard to take seriously. Yeah, well, 
you don't have to take everything seriously. No, I mean, it's the bloody A-Team movie. How seriously can you take uh, a white-haired guy in a cigar, a psychiatric pilot, a ladies' man, and Mr. T teaming up to help the disadvantaged who are being abused by mercenaries? And Mr. T. Yeah, Mr. T. Uh, who we've now taken to calling B.A. Brackus after watching this, because it's really weird to call Quentin Rampage Jackson Mr. T, because they're two completely different people. Yeah. No, the A-Team is definitely not a take-this-seriously source material, and I think uh, trying to make it that would have been a mistake, but as you say, it looks... You seem to think they would have had to at least present some of it as that, just to get it made? Yeah, because... It, it just what well, cheese wasn't popular at the time, was it? No, no. Cinema was a bit lactose intolerant in that way. Yeah, at the time. I mean, it wasn't really until, I guess, the Avengers hit two years later that, you know, well, or maybe Captain America the year before, Marvel something hit a couple of years later that cheese started becoming acceptable again. Yeah, and I'm not going to make the obligatory joke about Ralph Fiennes and Uma Thurman and Sean Connery dressed up as teddy bears. Was there an obligatory joke there? Yeah, yeah, because the, do you not remember the Avengers movie that came out ten years before, which was really daft and involved Sean Connery, Ralph Fiennes, who was a villain, and Uma Thurman dressing up as teddy bears? I never saw that one. Okay, maybe we should add that to the list, the Avengers movie. <laughs> Based on the British show Avengers, which is, I think, the reason why in the UK the first Avengers movie is called Avengers Assemble, so that people won't think it's a cinematic re-release of the old Sean Connery classic. Yeah. Uh, that was a 90s movie, because I remember it being referenced in Phoenix Nights. Yeah. So I think it achieved its goals well enough to be a fun ride, but not as well as it could have had it just committed to the A-Team cheesiness premise. I remember after I saw this in the cinema, having no plans, ironically, considering it's a movie with Hannibal Smith in, to see it, and coming away being slightly fascinated by it. And I remember reading into it and seeing that actually a lot of people who grew up watching the show as a kid really loved it. And ironically, the guy... Uh, oh, what's his name that plays face? Um... I wanted to say Justin Chapman, but no... Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Yeah, uh, apparently Bradley Cooper wanted to watch the A-Team growing up, but his parents wouldn't allow it because it was too violent. And it's ironic that he ended up playing Face. Although, I knew I knew his voice from somewhere. He voices Rocket Raccoon in the MCU. Yeah, yeah, I knew that. Yeah, and he was Face Man Peck. (laughs) (laughs) Uh what more is there to say? It's uh, I think it, well, it achieved the goals that I wanted it to. Was in yeah. I'm not like someone who grew up with it because obviously I was born too late for that. But when I watched the show, I enjoyed it and I like that it perfectly encapsulated what made the show so fun. I still wish it had been a bit brighter in tone though. Like it, yeah, it did well enough. After it's weird fashion. because I think if yeah I think if it was made five years later it would have benefited by being able to get away with doing more silly cheese stuff, but also the time probably would have passed for it. It does surprise me that they never even tried to make a sequel to this, or did they? I don't think they did. I never heard anything about that. I'm gonna look into this now, but it's a weird one because I would have gone to see a sequel of it, but I'm not sure many other people would have done. Yeah. But you'd think they'd have tried. Yeah, I'm going to look into this. Because I remember the cast saying they're all down for it. No, not the Ed Sheeran song. Uh, Let me have a look. Well, Dwight Schultz and Dirk Benedict filmed cameos. And they, of course, played Murdoch and Peck themselves. Yeah. And uh, Mr. T declined a cameo because he felt it would distract from Rampage Jackson's performance. Yeah, I can respect that. um... Yeah, and also he just looks too iconic. There's no mistaking him for anybody else in the world. So a cameo wouldn't have worked. Yeah, and also Rampage Jackson has to look like B.A. Baracus, who looks exactly like Mr. T, because that's who it is. Having two of them would be a bit, (laughs) you know, a bit weird. Apparently Roger Ebert didn't like it. I find that oddly surprising. Yeah, because he doesn't seem to take things... Well, didn't. Uh, 
He, he didn't seem to take things too seriously, did he? Mind you, Roger Ebert also thought that Babe 2 was better than Bicentennial Man. What, you, you think you prefer the Bicentennial? Do you know what? Yeah. That's, a, that's a respectable opinion. I'm not sure I disagree. Cancelled sequel, Ollie. Oh, right, go on. Neeson, Cooper, Copley and Jackson originally expressed interest in doing a sequel. I remember they were all in for it. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the director wanted to return to direct the sequel. Uh, but apparently the film didn't generate enough revenue for there to be a sequel. Which is oh, sad. Well, I guess it didn't achieve its goals as well as it could have then. Yeah, that's it, really sad. It uh, didn't make enough money to make a sequel. Yeah, which is a shame since everyone was down to do another one. Yeah. Do you reckon it's too late? Like, if the right people talked to the right people now, could you get everyone back? And do you think it would be too late for them to do it? Well, that's the sad thing. I'm not sure, well, obviously not right now, but I'm not sure there'd be the audience for it in the 20s. Uh, Maybe? I think once cinema comes back and, you know... The whole pandemic thing is over. People will rush out to see basically anything. Yeah, so, that's like, true. <laughs> they could release some right dross. Yeah, quick, get Malcolm they... McDowell over. Let's film some shit. <laughs> <laughs> Babe 20? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> did the movie exceed your expectations? Uh, it did. Yeah, yeah. It was more fun than I was expecting. Yeah, it continues to be more fun than I was expecting. Yeah, it's like visiting an obscure relative you don't know very well and being pleasantly surprised that they're not horrible. Yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, this is one of those films that I could rewatch like any time. Oh, given that it's a modern reboot of an eighties TV show, it's like visiting an obscure relative that you know is kind of objectionable, but then they're actually well behaved that one time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, this movie exceeded my expectations. It was a lot more entertaining than I was expecting. And it's one of those I could probably rewatch every six months if I was feeling down and it would cheer me up. Yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, it's a good time film. It's a popcorn movie in the best possible way. Yeah, is there some way we could try and petition cinemas to re-show this? Yeah, it's a good time. Places should re-show it. <laughs> yeah, because I love how they re-show classics, but uh, they should re-show more obscure movies sometimes. Yeah. Just give them a second chance, I mean... If I owned a movie theatre, I would occasionally show the 80s. I would. I would just show stuff like Dunstan Checks In. <laughs> like, even if only four people turned up and two of them were you and me, I would run things that way. Yeah. We'd lose a lot of money. There would be one screen dedicated to just whatever random crap I felt like throwing on to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is there an element in the film that particularly appeals? Um, I'm not sure, you know. I guess the spectacle of it. Yeah. A big budget episode of The 18 was something I would have wanted to see because I did actually watch a few episodes of The 18 Kid and I liked it. Yeah, you could imagine that the writer's room of the A-Team TV show chatting and saying, oh, we need to do a bit where they fly a tank by using the recoil of the massive gun to steer it in a direction. And they're like, no, we don't have the budget for that. Are you crazy? It's like, okay, but we'll keep that in the shelf. We're going to do that. There were tanks in the A-Team. Yeah, but they didn't fly them, Molly. How hard would it have been? Well, I suppose in the 80s it would yeah. have been quite hard. And like, I'm sure they would have conceptualised things like the whole switcheroo with the... Uh, shipment containers and the ship blowing up and the flames going in an X. I'm, I'm sure that's the kind of stuff they would have wanted to do back then but not have a budget to do. So it's kind of nice that they do all these crazy things in this movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say that the action was an element that particularly appealed. It felt very A-team despite being a lot higher octane than what they could have accomplished previously. I like how they do all the cheesy tropes. They do the heist tropes. They do the whole uh, nobody really gets killed trope. But for the most part, they have a few scenes where people are seen to definitely die, but it's kept very PG-13. Like They do this running joke where F-bombs are hinted at but never done. They say shit yeah. a few times, which obviously they would not have done on the show. No, definitely not. No. <laughs> well, that's all okay. It's for cinematic release. 
They should do it at least once. Yeah. Also, the chemistry between all the characters. Yeah, yeah, you, but yeah, they're very. It's a very believable dynamic, isn't it? Yeah, they really captured the spirit of camaraderie that the original show had between the four main characters. Yeah. Like, it was yeah. believable. It, they were perfect recasts, actually. Yeah, I would agree. Hmm. I had to think for a second, but yeah, I would agree. And the dialogue was good as well. Yeah, I can't think of any... It was just silly the back and forth. Um, <laughs> Rampage Jackson having a go at Hannibal was always a laugh. And then him promising to cook him something he likes. I love to... that, and I love that that calms Calm him down. down. I like how that works, and I like better... how they know each other enough. You better get your apron on. <laughs> I, and that's why I love the whole trope of BA's fear of flying, because he reluctantly gets in the plane when he knows that it's the only way they're getting out there alive. So yeah. you do get across the trust between the characters through things like that, because you know their vices, you know what they like, what they don't feel comfortable with, and you know that they only ask things of them when they know that it's necessary. Yeah. I, I like the meet when they all meet at the beginning. Yeah, yeah. That felt like a very organic scene, because obviously uh, two of them already knew each other, uh, you know, Face and uh, Murdoch and, sorry, Hannibal and... Hannibal happened across BA in the desert. That was a good scene. I like their instruction how they met each other. And and he shoots his van while shooting his arm and he's more worried about the van. I love that and I like the introduction scenes for the characters because it sort of sets them up as the good guys very well. Because we know nothing yeah. about the situation they're in. We don't know for sure they're the good guys but they manage to establish it very quickly like the bit where um, Hannibal is tied up and the dogs are set on him, and you see him assembling his gun. But he doesn't shoot the dogs, he just peacefully ties them together and sends them away. Yeah. And also, you've got the whole thing where B.A.'s driving a really fast, sharp-looking car, and then all he's really interested in is getting his van back. And I like that the A-Team van got to appear in this movie. Yeah. Also, the A-Team van being destroyed... By accident, by Murdoch, and that being the reason why BA has a fear of flying was hilarious to me. Yeah, that that was a good touch. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's not the the or we didn't ask for this origin story, but we got it, and I'm glad we did. You can see why I compared it to Solo earlier. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> similar deal. Yeah, sort of buddies coming together to do the heist. It's that kind of movie, and I like it for that. Or, or in their case, to clear their names of the heist. Yeah, and I do find it ironic and funny that they do this whole thing where they break out of jail in order to clear their names, and they still get arrested for breaking out of jail and presumably causing a lot of damage. Yeah. Because although it wasn't their fault that the docks got blown up, it was their fault that the plane got stolen and shot down, and the tank got stolen, and the canopies of the Fighter jets got shattered. Yeah, I mean, like, that's got to easily be in the hundreds of millions altogether. Oh, yes, and then there's all the stuff that happened in Berlin, which, again, wasn't all their fault, but they yeah. they do... Well, let's face it, the people who would be footing the bill are dead now, so... <laughs> yeah. Ollie, how does the film hold up today? All right. I don't see... Like, if it was released today, I don't see it doing too well, to be honest. Well, no, I mean, social distancing and all that. I mean, apart from that. Yeah, it's the sort of thing that would just go on to Amazon or Disney Plus and never get talked about again. Yeah. That's a good point. The 18 movie is now owned by Disney, so it's weird that this isn't on Disney Plus. Yeah, it is a bit weird, but... Oh, well. Does that make Jessica Biel a Disney princess? No. Ah, you're a bit of Jessica Biel, are it? Well, we all know that her only god is fire. Yes, apparently so. Yeah, the film holds up nicely for me today. It looks very much like the kinds of action movies that were being made ten years ago, but it feels timeless. It feels like that kind of fun that you watch an episode of the A-Team for when you're a bit bored and you're watching UK TV Gold. Yeah. But with a bigger budget, so they can do more fun things. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad they got the opportunity to make this movie. Yeah, I'm glad it was made. I think it could have been made to be a more complete version of what it is, 
but I'm glad that it was made. And I, you have to have at least seen the A team to fully appreciate it. Yeah, because if you just watched it on its own merits, its own individual thing, you probably wouldn't get what all the fuss is about. So that's why I don't think it holds up super well today, because it doesn't really stand on its own. You have to be aware of the A team and what it's like to fully appreciate this. It feels very much like a setup for a greater story, which is what the TV show obviously is the greater story. But if you're watching it on your own, you'd be confused without any knowledge of the show. You'd be confused as to what this is setting up for. Yeah. Because as an origin story, it does feel like it's setting up for a sequel, which we obviously never got because the original didn't do well enough. When I say the original, I mean the movie we just watched. So, finally, was the film received appropriately at the time? I don't know. Uh... Well, for starters, I don't remember it being a huge hit at the cinema, and obviously it didn't do well enough to... Justify a sequel, apparently. Yeah. Uh, how well did, it had a budget of 110 million, so it cost just over a bicentennial man to make, and it made 177.2 million. So it turned a profit, just not much of one, we, like not as much of one as it was hoping. Yeah, which seems to be a pattern in a lot of the films that we review lately. Yeah. You can see why they'd think that a sequel would be a bit of a risk because. In order to keep up the tempo from the last one, you'd need a good budget, and there'd be no guarantees you'd get that return. Yeah, I suppose not. Curious to see what critics think of this. I'm going to do our usual thing and look at Rotten Tomatoes, because obviously we're not that good as um, movie journalists, and this is what we consider to be the epitome of criticism on the internet. I'm just here to chat about films, really. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm joking, I'm being self-derogatory. The A-team assembles a top-rate cast only to ditch the show's appealing, silly premise for an explosive yet muddled blockbuster filmmaking. Yeah, that seems fair. Yeah, I don't feel like they did ditch the show's premise, but they could have leant into it a lot more, and you got the feeling that they wanted to, but they were kind of too afraid to, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. Uh, Yeah, 49% according to this. Of the critics liked it. I think it's better than that, but... Yeah, audience score is 66%, and I think that's fairer. Yeah, I think that is fairer. So, yeah, I'd say it was received more or less appropriately at the time. Yeah, because at the end of the day, what really matters is what the audience thought. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad it was popular enough. I wish it was a bit more popular, because I think it did deserve to do a little bit better, but honestly, I'm just glad this movie got to be made. Yeah. All right, so any conclusion? Any concluding thoughts? Not really. It was a pretty fun movie. I don't know if I'd watch it again on my own, but I'd always be up for it if it was what people I was with wanted to watch. In Sonic Temple of Doom, it's a fun time movie you watch with friends, and that's how it's best experienced. Yeah, yeah. It's also a kind of movie you can watch with family as well. Okay, well, next week we are going to be looking at <laughs> Devin Rattray's most famous movie of all time, no, it's not Home Alone. No, it's not Home Alone 2. It's Caught in Condy. I am astounded such a thing exists, so I'm looking forward to that. And this is probably only the second time on this channel that we're both watching a movie that neither of us have seen before, so we're in for a surprise in any case. Yeah. Whether it's a good surprise or a bad surprise, you're going to have to tune in. It's, well, tune in. it's the bloody internet. You're going to have to go on to YouTube and find out next week. Yeah. Thanks for watching, and uh, we will see you next week for Courting Condi. Yeah, and then until next time, love it when your plans come together, as the show would say. Yes. I ain't getting on no plane. <sighs> uh. Okay. See you next week. See you next week, Bye. guys.